The last three weeks here at the farm, I have tested the three major drone manufacturers for spray drones currently offered in the United States. The drone that I thought I would end up purchasing to spray acres with this upcoming year was not the one I went with, but let me tell you why. The drone that I thought I was gonna buy, which is the DJI T50, which came to the farm, flew just a couple weeks ago, but I'm not gonna be getting that one because there's potential government ban on all of the DJI stuff coming to the United States because of governmental issues. So I'd, I'd hate to spend $30,000, $40,000 on a drone, not be able to repair it, not be able to get parts, not be able to do updates to it. So as much as I like the DJI stuff, it just didn't seem like the way to go. The other drone, the EA Vision J100, that's the most recent drone that I've demoed. That drone I liked, it seemed like the user interface was similar to DJI's. It's gonna be US manufactured. Had a lot of benefits to that one, just couldn't get over the smaller 13 and a half gallon tank in comparison to the drone that I purchased. Which leads us now to the drone that I bought. So there's, XAG is the brand, the manufacturer, and they have two offerings. So the first is the P100 Pro, which I tested here at the farm just a couple weeks ago. And the other is the P150, an updated, better version of the P100 Pro. Now here's where the problem came in. The P100 Pro, it's a good drone, costs about $30,000, you can get about 40 actual acres done an hour. Now switch over to the P150, this drone's about 43,000, you can get about 50 acres done in an hour. I didn't really necessarily need the bigger drone, but number one, I didn't really wanna spend a lot of money on technology that was gonna be already going on three years old. And number two, my family, we farm 2,000 acres. You can do the math. This drone can spray, spray about 50 acres in an hour, eight hour days, in about five days, I'll have all of our acres sprayed with this drone. So naturally now, I started running the numbers for how long this drone's gonna take to make me a return on my investment. So I'm gonna have about $43,000 invested in just the drone, all of the batteries, the chargers, and everything there on the drone. And then on this side is all my costs I'm gonna have for the trailer, which I'll show you guys the trailer here in a second, but generator, I already have 5,000. The tanks, I'm gonna have close to another 4,000. And then I'm gonna need some plumbing and miscellaneous things on the trailer. So I'm guessing I'm gonna have about 15,000 in the trailer. Total, I'm gonna be right under $60,000. Now, like I mentioned, our farm, we farm about 2,000 crop acres. A cu current cost of a custom applicator to spray using a drone or using an airplane, it's gonna be about $10 an acre. So you run the math, $10 an acre times 2,000 acres. I'm gonna be saving $20,000 a year by spraying all of our acres myself. Now that may sound like a lot of money considering it's a $60,000 investment, I'm gonna be saving $20,000 a year, but that doesn't pay for all the expenses I'm gonna have in my time, all the expenses I'm gonna have in fuel for the generator, for the truck to pull the trailer, all the other miscellaneous things that are going into me custom applying all of our acres. So all this eventually then got led up to finally they have the bill, I'm about to write out the check, and they say, so do you want the bill made out to Matthias Kuhnerth, or do you have a drone application business LLC name that you want this written out to? And naturally that leads into questions of me going, well, why would I want an LLC for my drone application business? I never really thought I'd start a drone application business. Tell me about the benefits of that for me, rather than just spraying all my own personal acres with this drone. So the salesman starts telling me, well, you know, if you set it up as an LLC, then all these licenses that I need to actually use my drone since it weighs more than 55 pounds, if I were ever to go out and hire someone else to spray my drone, I wouldn't have to pay another $1,500 for someone to use my drone because I have the 137 exemption under my name. And I'm like, well, you know, I might as well set up an LLC. That way I can maybe save myself $1,500 down the road which led into me learning how to set up an LLC, eventually calling my tax accountant, learning I need to go to the Minnesota Secretary of State's office, create a business name, which first time ever on camera, High Tech Drone Applications LLC, that's the name of my drone application business, set that up as a business, that way I could then open up a business checking account at the bank, that way all my expenses would be in one account. So I got all that stuff set up. 
Then I learned, oh hey, by the way, now that I plan on spraying fields that aren't mine, now the state requires me to be a commercial applicator, which means I need to become an aerial applicator, I need to become a pesticide applicator, I need to become an applicator for crops, for pastures, and I think for CRP. So for all five of those things, I now have five exams that I need to take at the conservation office before I can even spray any sort of chemical on any fields that aren't mine. All in all though, I am really excited to get the drone. I'm really nervous though to get everything up and running just because, you know, summer's gonna be here in no time and I'm gonna have to have all my licenses passed, have basically everything ready to go, including the trailer. That way when end of July rolls around and I need to spray, I already have everything ready to go. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that end. But for today's purposes, we're gonna go start mapping some of our fields. So we'll get everything ready inside the gator here. As far as I can tell, all of the fields are in the display. Last year I mapped all of our fields and there was a couple of them that didn't quite map perfectly. And I don't remember exactly which ones they are. I know some of them that will tell me on the computer so we'll head up to the office, but some of them, it says that they're mapped right, but they didn't work in the field. So I'm gonna create a printout of all of our field names. That way who's ever running the planter this spring, if there is a problem with the boundary, if I'm not in the planter, they can mark a note, AKA dad. Then when I can come back and map it again, so hopefully we don't have to do this again in the future, we can get them all dialed in. I'll show you what I'm trying to do, come down to land. So for this particular field, you can see this pink line. This is the boundary I'll be making with the gator here in a moment. So this is the boundary I made last winter. You can see I created that one January 7th of 2024. And for some reason, this one is RTK Extend. I don't want it to be RTKX. I just wanted to say RTK. That X means it didn't always have constant RTK. Or it didn't always have the connections it needed to the right antennas. And I think I got that issue figured out. So this is one field in particular that we'll end up remapping today. Now I'll just go through all the fields that we have, check to see which ones don't have RTK boundaries outside of them, create a nice little list. That way we know which fields to go to when we head out with the Ranger. Here's the list I just made inside the office. All the fields with the RTKX. Those are all the fields that we got to remap. I last year used this bar and this chain to mark where the planter would hit. So if there's any fence posts, if this hits it, the planter's going to be hitting it. This thing weighs too much. So this year we're going to design something a little bit different to ride up on the Ranger. Let me explain the reasoning we had to set all this stuff up like this. So the way our ranger's set up, we got the globe set right there in the middle. And then my first row of corn seed is going to be 15 inches off of that center line. So if I measure here, I'll show you 15 inches right there. And then because there is a weight bracket that is 30 inches wide at the end, I needed to add another 30 inches to this post. That way when we create our boundaries, we don't hit any of the fence lines that might be out in the fields with the planter. So if I measure over from roughly where the tape measure is, which is where that first row is, over another 30 inches, that is where our little chain is gonna be swinging. When we get this thing out to the field, if that post or if that little chain there hits Anything out in the field, that means the planter is going to hit it. So as long as we stay that far away, all of our boundaries should be dialed in. So we're at the first field. We are ready to start mapping. You can see we got RTK there. This is actually my field for this upcoming year. And margins are tight in farming right now. So I'm going to try to get as close to the field edge as possible. That way I can get as many seeds per acre as planted out here. And then once we finish this field, we'll do a quick little buzz around to make sure everything mapped exactly like we want. What I'm doing here today with this GPS globe and this computer inside the Ranger, the thought is we should not need to touch the steering wheel at all when going around the outside edges of the field, which like I said, super nice so you don't hit anything, but also super nice 
Because if we ever want to start a field, start planting late at night, there is no worries of hitting anything because it's all going to drive itself and it just takes away a lot of the stress of planting a field. Here's a nice little map that we just made for this field. I'm going to run back to the farm, we'll offload that map onto a USB and then plug it into the computer just to make sure it says RTK so we know it, we did it right before we head to any more fields. Looking here at the boundary we just made. Now if I scroll down, yep, those words right there. RTKX, that is not what I want to see. So I'm running into the same problem that we did last year. For some reason we're not keeping our RTK signal. I'm gonna go out to the field again and try it basically again and see what happens. I've been playing around out in this field for a good hour, hour and a half, trying to figure out what the problem is. I think I finally figured it out. The way that RTK works, or the satellite works here, is this globe right here needs to talk to the globe that the neighbor has about four miles away on top of one of his legs. And the problem I'm running into is since I'm in like a low spot of this field, as you can tell, there's a big draw here. I'm losing connectivity to his tower which means I'm not keeping consistent RTK all the time. Which basically leaves me with two options. Option number one, forget I even came out here, forget I even tried to get some of these other fields to work, still use a steering wheel in the spring, and that's one option. And option number two, which is, of course, spend a bunch more money, and that's what I've been doing, looking at the last 20 minutes, is looking on my phone, seeing if how much more the next receiver up, so I have a Starfire 6000, they have a Starfire 7000. This has higher accuracy, rather than using another globe to for a correction, they use satellites up in space for correction of this new globe, so that would cost me about $3,000 plus an annual subscription fee of about $1,500. Well, I think that's probably what we're gonna do is get a new globe for this. It's not really what I wanna do. I don't feel like spending more money and paying more annual subscription to John Deere, but it seems like that's probably the smart decision just with the way technology's evolving. I can still get pretty good money for that one. So fortunately I didn't get a ton done today like I'd hoped, but that's it for today's video of High Tech Farmer. Thanks so much everybody for watching. We'll see ya in the next one.